Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Lisa Parker, Director of the Center for Bioethics and Health Law here at the University of Pittsburgh. It's my pleasure to continue our collaboration with the Department of Pediatrics, through which we bring to campus a lecture in ethics. This is, in fact, the 25th Madeiras Memorial Lecture. It was established to honor Dr. Donald N. Madeiras, Jr. He was known for his encyclopedic memory, his compassion, his advocacy for minority students and women in medicine, his widow, Mary Ellen Marble, and his children, Donald, Ellen, John, and Jennifer, founded this lectureship as a testament to both his hope for the future and his particular legacy. Dr. Medeiros earned his medical degree at Harvard Medical School, where he later served as a faculty member for two decades. He interned at Barnes Hospital in St. Louis and was a resident at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. His virology fellowship at Children's Hospital in Boston launched his research on infection and virus transmission from mothers to their newborns. In 1965, Dr. Medeiros became medical director of Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and professor and chair of the Department of Pediatrics and then dean of the School of Medicine from 1969 to 1973. Three events and themes in the professional life of Dr. Madera suggest that our selection of today's speaker is particularly apt. First, in 1979, Dr. Madera was appointed to the President's Commission for the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine and Biomedical and Behavioral Research. It was the first such national commission on bioethics, and Dr. Madera contributed foundational work in research ethics and on issues at the end of life and in organ transplantation. Second, in a tribute written about Dr. Medeiros upon his death, his Harvard colleagues wrote of his intellectual curiosity and his constant refrain of show me the data. Third, here in Pittsburgh, he worked with Dr. Kenneth Rogers to establish a neighborhood clinic on the hill above the medical school in our hill district. And he spearheaded a program to recruit minority students into medicine. It is thus especially fitting that this year's Madeira's lecture is Dr. Lecturer is Dr. Keisha Ray, a bioethicist and recognized expert on the integrating race education into medical school curricula. Dr. Ray is an associate professor with the McGovern Center for Humanities and Ethics at the McGovern Medical School at UT Health Houston. She also serves as the director of the McGovern Center's Medical Humanities Scholarly Concentration. Dr. Ray earned her doctorate in philosophy from the University of Utah with a focus on bioethics. Most of her research focuses on the, ethic, the effects and ethics of institutional racism on Black people's health. Her work highlights Black people's own stories in Black health discourse and the socio and political implications of biomedical enhancement for marginalized populations. Her work advocates for the use of simple language as a matter of access and justice. Dr. Ray is published in the AMA Journal of Ethics, the American Journal of Bioethics, the Hastings Center Report, Bioethics, Pediatrics. Her book, Black Health, The Social, Political, and Cultural Determinants of Black People's Health, was published this year, coming out in March, by Oxford University Press. It's been described as illuminating the role of health disparities in the maintenance of anti-Black racism, as well as the more familiar role of racism in creating health disparities. Bringing together Dr. Medeiros's interest in data and ethics and his advocacy of clinical education, including previously underrepresented group members, and attending to matters of race. Today, Dr. Ray will present a talk entitled, Stories and Statistics, Balancing Trust and Proper Healthcare for Black Patients. Please welcome Dr. Keisha Ray. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Lisa, for that. Um, and thank you for the invitation 
I want to support staff, Mia, Savannah, I appreciate those things. I know um, organizing speakers is not easy. It's lots of moving parts, so I appreciate all the moving parts. Um, I am probably going to cut it down just a little bit today because I think that the value is in the conversation. The value of these kinds of um, situations is where you get to exchange ideas and talk about it. And just as a point of reference, I understand that sometimes people don't have the exact question or maybe it's something muddled in their brain and they just want some help getting the question out there. So I hope that this is a space where you feel like it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to not have it all right because this is a learning space and uh, I want that to be um, uh, an appropriate thing. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about how I view Black health and how I approach it and how there's two ways to think about stories from Black people and the marginalized populations in general. One from a research perspective and then from a clinical perspective. But for me, it's really about um, what can stories tell us about Black patients and how can that contribute to ending racial disparities and health outcomes and um, what can clinicians and researchers do to help that given all of the inequities that exist outside of the space where we see patients and we see research participants. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, like I said, about how I approach Black health, and that's this mixture of stories and statistical information, but both types of data. Um, the power and responsibility that comes when you're a storyteller or you are um, the person listening to someone else's story. I'll use the example of pediatric asthma, and then we'll talk a little bit about listening and what this means for, for clinicians. So first off, this is how I will be approaching this talk. So we know a lot about um, the racial disparities that exist among Black people, right? We know that there are disparities in um, uh, cancer diagnoses, diabetes, hypertension, um, pain care, pain therapy. We know there's differences in cardiovascular disease. We even know that there's differences in who gets sleep that falls along racial lines. And so for me, whenever I'm thinking about why these things happen, how can we talk about solutions? What are the reasons? I try to make sure that I'm looking at this intersectional idea of race, gender, and class, but how they map onto social, cultural, and political identities, and how those intersect with those institutions that have a lot of influence on our health. And so when there's inequities in things like housing, healthcare, um, economic standing, legal standing, I try to mesh all of these things together because I think that looking at any sort of disparity from one angle, it doesn't do it justice. If we're looking at it just from healthcare or just from an economic standpoint, it doesn't give us the full story, right? Okay. Um, and so it's all about meshing these things together. So for me, I can't look at any aspect of why Black people have generally poorer health than other people without looking at how those identities intersect with these institutions. So this is something you probably have all seen before. I like this chart because one, it's color coded and that makes it aesthetically pleasing. But also I like that it's very thorough, right? And it has a lot, you have these sort of major categories at the top and then you have all of these different aspects of society and of life at the bottom. And one reason why I like this is it simplifies health, but it also complicates health. So it simplifies it and it says, well, look at all these things that affect your health, right? I mean, and that's kind of a lot. And it's almost every single thing in our entire life can affect our health, right? And so I like it in that it, it's very laid out. It talks about health and well-being, mortality, morbidity. But I also like that it complicates it, especially for clinicians, because you could be looking at this and say, well, I have no control of the walkability of my patient's neighborhood. I have no control over their access to higher education or their, what kind of income they make. I have no control over the environment. Do they have access to clean air and clean water? Um, I have some control over the healthcare system, but even then you may have just some control over how you treat them, the time you see them, when you see them, that kind of thing. 
So I like that it complicates this a little bit for clinicians because there's so much that you can look at this and say, this is beyond my purview. But I like that it also raises the question of what does this mean for Black patients, right? What does it mean in your life to have a lot of medical debt? What does it mean for your life to have a lot of student loan debt? What does it mean when you don't have access to clean air because you live near pollutant emitting facilities? And that's what I'm interested in hearing the stories is what does that mean? What does that feel like? What is that lived experience beyond just this pretty list? And that's what I care about. So the stories. So for me, when I think about stories, what I mean is when people are telling you about themselves. When they're sharing this side of themselves and they're telling you, this is why I feel this way. This is what's going on with me. So I know that sometimes stories, we all have sort of preconceived notions, whether that's you telling your kids a little story at nighttime before bed, or you reading a story, or you listen to one on your Kindle or something like that. For me, what I mean is just this part of you that you are sharing with other people, your story, the who you are as a person. And I think... And I think I know everyone has a story and how that can be seen in the clinical setting is what, what I'm interested in here. So when I think about Black health for me, I think it has to include storytelling. And one reason I say that is we cannot think about Black patients or think about Black populations without the story because for so long, the story was taken away from people. The story was removed. They weren't allowed to tell their stories. And even to this day, we have lots of issues with their stories being believed when they express, this is how I feel, this is what's going on, this is what's the matter. Um, and so it's a matter of voice. And a lot of our Black ancestors would have their stories and their lives stolen from them. And so they would use their stories to sort of keep their culture alive, to keep their history alive. And I think even though um, it's not as dire, it is still something that's relevant to how we, inter how, how we uh, mitigate these institutions that try to take those things. And I also think when we, I'm a medical school educator myself, I teach MS1 through MS4, talk to clinicians, also dental students. And a lot of times when, by the time they come to my classes, I was sharing this with the group yesterday, they have the numbers and the statistical data down pat, especially the MS4s, right? They can shoot off the number of Black Americans that have diabetes, the number of Black Americans that have hypertension. They are very, very good at the population level information. But for me, the stories represent that data for these individual people. It gives us the full story of what does that data mean and what does it look like? And that's the only way that we can talk about, well, how do we lessen those numbers? And so I think we have to talk about this population level and the individual level, but think about what lessons from storytelling that we can take to treat Black patients better. So letting these stories guide this care. And now we'll be talking about, talk a little bit to you about power. So this is a buzzword that you've probably heard a lot lately, power dynamics in different settings. Um, you may have heard about sharing of power or an exchange of power. And what I talk about this here is when we're listening to a patient tell you what's wrong, or if you're a researcher and you're listening to a, pay, uh, a participant tell you their story, Black patients bring their individual story with them anytime you see them, whatever the setting is. But they're also bringing that history from the stories that they've heard from their friends, from their family members whether that's mistreatment from clinicians, whether that's inequities in some social institution. They're listening to stories on social media about some situation that went wrong for another patient. And so when, the, when you're seeing a Black person, you're seeing all these stories sort of with this body. And stories for them, because it's so, telling your story can make you so vulnerable, listening can be this way of reclaiming their power um, because telling your story can be incredibly frightening. I don't know if any of you have ever um, ever shared at a party, maybe you've had a couple of glasses of wine and you start talking and then afterwards you go home and you're like, I can't believe I just told them about my childhood trauma or something like that, right? Oh, have you ever done it more formally, written about yourself, written your own story? I've done that a few times. And every time I do, I never sleep the night, the night after because I'm worried about 
who's talking about it on Twitter. I just revealed this very intimate part of myself, this clinical experience that I had. And I shared one with the group yesterday. I had a clinical experience go live on the internet uh, just this week. And I haven't slept because I just keep thinking about sharing this part of myself. And it really made me think about what I was going to talk to you all about today. And I made some changes because just thinking about this act of exchanging power, I felt like this story gives me power to share it, right? But at the same time, now it's, it's, it's almost like an act of shared power because now other people are going to be reading it, taking their own conclusions from it, whether that's good or bad, whether it's what I intended or not intended. So when we're sharing stories, it's just sort of, I have this power, this is my story, but now that I'm giving it to you and I know that you all are the gatekeepers of healthcare and that I'm sharing the story in the hopes that you'll give me help and care in return, but when you have to also think about how racism, how sexism, how ableism, how all the isms might mitigate that relationship of uh, me tell you my story, you give me care, then it makes it even more frightening to share your story. And important here is to think about who is a storyteller. Um, and in this part, I want to change it just a little bit to talk about the listener, right? Retelling the story first is a, it's a powerful position. You have a lot of privilege when you're retelling stories. A lot of my work is retelling patient stories for pedagogical reasons, for research reasons. And I always have to think about this position of power that I'm in. So if you're ever in a research position and you are writing a book, you're doing a presentation and you're relaying this story, you have to sort of think about the position that you're in and the privileges that you have to share someone else's story. How do we keep other people at the forefront of their own story? How do we make sure that we are taking extra care with marginalized people's stories, especially when their stories have been taken from them so often? And so being a good storyteller, but also being a good listener can be one of those ways that we empower patients to keep telling their story, to hold on to their story, but then at the same time, helping them make the best decisions for themselves. It's that listening. And so one way that I, wait, did I skip a slide? One second, there we go. So one way that I've done this, and I do this in my classrooms when I'm talking to clinicians and even medical students, is I talk to them a little bit about what it means to listen to a story, to be a good listener, but then also to take seriously the responsibility of telling someone else's story. And so three things that I sort of take into account when I'm trying to combine this approach of using stories to illuminate the data. The data gives us the population level, the stories give us the individual level information. And I try to combine those and use this as a way for clinicians to better treat patients and for researchers to be more responsible with those stories is I try to look at these three different tenets here. And so um, let's see. So let me make sure. So stories allow this sort of passive observation of the ways in which other human beings experience the world without imposing our judgment. And so that's one thing that I think is super, super important is how do we abstract ourselves the things that we would want, how we would see the world when we're listening to someone else's story, because that's important, but it's also difficult. When you're hearing someone share their story and you think, oh, well, I would have done X or I would have done Y or I would have, this would have made me angry. Or actually, that wouldn't have made me angry. One of the things that's very, very hard when you're listening to someone is how to abstract yourself and just listen to the story for what it is. And so for me, um, I use these shorter testimonies rather than using these longer narratives because I find that they're more memorable, but they're also easier to put into, um, into lessons in the classroom. So I think um, when you're in this observer position, you have to make sure that you are not inserting your own individual identities onto the patient, which, like I said, can be very difficult. But when you are listening to an experience, especially from someone whose experience is very different from yours, maybe one that you absolutely cannot relate to, I think that's when it's even more important. And if we think about 
who are the researchers and who are the clinicians? I mean, even from this room, right? Majority of the people who are listening to patient stories, who are interviewing research participants, and we're looking at bioethical scholars, looking at clinicians, they will not look like the marginalized populations that are telling us their stories. They'll be very different. Um, if you're listening to um, disabled participants, most of the people listening to those stories will be able bodied right? Um, we have gender differences, we have racial differences, we have class differences. And so I think that's when we have to take this extra precaution in being a great uh, listener and making sure that when we talk about health, Black people's health, that we are making sure to situate them and not ourselves. And so I'm gonna give you this example that I use to talk about these three in a little bit more detail in black birthing mortality. So in New York, you may have heard this research before, researchers found that even when black women have a college degree, their chances of dying during or soon after birth are still three times higher than white women who never completed a high school diploma. Uh, this is also an issue in the United Kingdom where black maternal mortality has been a, a growing public health concern. Um, in 2016, for every 100,000 deaths during pregnancy, there are eight white women compared to 40 Black women. So the CDC has come out and said, you know, this is not about uh, Black people's greater propensity for death during or soon after pregnancy, but rather it's a lack of access to social determinants of health. Um, and they particularly talk about weathering. If you all heard this idea of weathering, how social dissed, basically the idea of weathering is how your social disadvantages can wear your body down, regardless of who you are. You don't have to be Black to experience weathering. When you consistently don't have access to the things that you need, like income, proper housing, care, love, those kinds of things, it wears your body down and contributes to early mortality, that it literally can shorten your the telomeres when you don't have access to the social determinants of health. So it's another way to think about why do Black people have higher rates of mortality and morbidity. Um, so the CDC has specifically targeted anti-Black racism and maternal mortality, um, have talked about even how do we prove, improve patient-provider interactions, health communication. And so the data alone indicates that there's something else going on besides biology that makes Black pregnant people vulnerable to death. But I think it's those stories that we hear around this that tell us how racism impacts the individual pregnant person, but then also their families. And so I'm going to give you this story. This is the story of Toby Orden. She was pregnant during uh, the early days of the pandemic. And being a Black woman, she knew that she would likely face some kind of racial bias from clinicians. So she sort of tried to prepare herself, get herself ready for this process. Uh, but she went into health, she went into the clinical setting. Um, and because it was the early days of the pandemic, her husband was not allowed. It was when they were trying to make sure that, you know, there weren't too many people in the clinic. And after her 60 hours of labor, she developed a fever. And then the providers made the decision to go ahead with a C-section. So they put her in the hospital corridor to wait. And again, like I said, her husband was not allowed to be there. So she was there by herself. Um, and when one of the doctors that was going to be operating on her walked by her, the doctor shouted, get this, get this COVID suspect out of here. Why is she here? And in that moment, Oregon said, you know, this was not the moment to confront the doctor or to say anything because one, you get the loud Black woman stereotype, the angry Black woman stereotype. But then also, she's in a vulnerable position. She knows that this is the doctor that's going to be operating on her, that's going to be putting her life and her child in this person's hands. Probably don't want to be them angry or completely racist, right, before you are about to go under surgery. So in Orton's own words, she says, despite thankfully leaving the hospital with a healthy baby, I want our healthcare system to see Black women as humans, not stereotypes, or objects that don't need love and care. I want a healthcare system that asks me what I need rather than tells me to carry on when I feel like I can't. That shows compassion to black women when we feel at our weakest. I want healthcare that doesn't call my husband a baby daddy when we attend a routine checkup in tracksuits. I want healthcare that in times of a pandemic or not, 
doesn't make me feel like a burden. I want doctors that see the fear on my face and console me. I'm not asking to be wrapped in cotton wool, but I am asking for care. And so for me, this very first line here, this centering the patient, not the illness or provider, for me, listening to that quote from her tells me how we can talk about um, the patient and using that story to illuminate all of the statistical information that we know about Black birthing mortality, that Black people are four times more likely to die before or after pregnancy. Louisiana is number one. Um, I'm in Texas. Texas is pretty high up there as well. Uh, but if for me, this shows how do we talk about the patient in this story rather than the C-section, rather than the 60 hours of labor, rather than even what the clinician said to her about being a COVID suspect. All those things are relevant and important and can teach us something. But for me, what I'm focused on is how does this make her feel? How does this, when she go home and tell her husband or her mother or father or her family about what happened, how does that then become imprinted on them so that when they go into their own clinical settings, they remember, oh, this is how you treated my daughter. This is how you treated my sister. Are you going to do the same thing to me? And this is how those stories sort of get passed down and then creates what we call distrust or Black people distrusting when really, like we talked about earlier um, yesterday, how these clinical encounters are creating the mistrust. Um, and so another feature that I often talk about is when I'm, especially when I'm talking to learners, is to not think of um, Black people's sort of behaviors or none of behaviors or health as sort of immoral or moral. You hear things like, oh, good behaviors, bad behaviors. But oftentimes, even when, not to take away agency from Black people, Black people can make good and bad decisions just like everyone else. Um, but a lot of the times, poor health gets blamed, people get blamed for their poor health when we don't look at the greater structural problems or the greater um, uh, inequities and in those social determinants in that list that we have. And so for me, these three ways of thinking about stories, and specifically when they're from Black people, always reminds me who to think about in the story who do I want to get my students to focus on? But also just who in these stories matter? And so stories for me can either acknowledge and reveal or deprive Black people of their humanity. And really for me, when I ask people is to think about when you're listening to a patient's story or you're telling a, a person's story, which side are you contributing to? And that's something that I constantly have to think and ask of myself even. So let's quickly get to the example so we can get to some Q&A. So I like this one, this uh, infograph. I like infographs in general. I think they're very catchy and colorful. But I like it particularly because it brings up a lot of the social determinants of health. We have some nighttime sleeping, so where you sleep. We have um, food, access to food, um, the cleanliness of home and access to time and resources to keep the home clean, um, proximity to pollution. And also, I like to be hereditary, but only in so far as we think about um, when people live together, especially multi-generational homes, the issues that one generation has, the other can have too. So it doesn't have to be an issue of biology, but it can be an issue of shared space, meaning shared inequities. So some of the things that you all probably know, so I'm not going to go into this too much, asthma is a major chronic disease in children. The triggers uh, for asthma can fall along racial lines. Um, children are more harmed by air pollution. And we have this numbers here where we have about 13% of Black children in the U.S. have asthma, 12% Indigenous, 8 white, and Hispanic. We know that hospitalizations for asthma are generally Black children, mostly Black boys, but that Black children have higher rates of hospitalization and higher rates of mortality. Slightly higher rates of diagnosis from children in poorer families, regardless of race. Um, and we do know that Black and Latin children are more likely to live and go to school in areas with low air quality, meaning they're more likely to go to school and live near highways, near, um, and again, I'm in Texas, so there's lots of oil and refineries and all those kinds of things. And then you look at where they're built, or even landfills where they're built, they're not built in rich neighborhoods. They're not built in predominantly white neighborhoods. So all of these sort of things that affect them. So that's the information for me. What should be in the story of asthma for Black health? 
So some of the things here, their proximity to facilities. Uh, what is their housing like? Who do they live with? Is anyone smoke there? What are their guardian's job? Uh, is their job hazardous to children's health? Are they bringing home toxins on their clothes? Um, do they have the time and money to provide necessary resources? So for me, again, all of this comes back to the social determinants of health, income, education, housing, environment, um, adverse childhood experiences. And why I'm creating this, this sort of story for you. So first we talked about just this basic infograph, then um, some of the basic facts, some of the questions I think that these basic facts raise, but then also the other part of the story I think is important is during the, the, the sort of height of COVID-19, we started to see who was, what children were having the greatest rates of mortality and they were indigenous, black and Latin, um, Latin children. But also we know that if you had asthma, you had a higher rate of being, a higher chance of being infected with COVID-19 virus um, and, and higher mortality rates. So if there are certain people that are more likely to have asthma because of environmental factors, and then those same people are now more likely to get infected with a virus during a pandemic, it seems like all of these parts of the story are relevant when we're talking about asthma, particularly um, among Black children. So to me, it's, you know, I'm sort of like, I know you've seen that meme where you have the string and you're, you're making all these connections and there's a board and you have these pictures, right? That's kind of what I'm doing when I'm looking at Black health. I'm like, oh, well, this is connected. And then draw a red shoe over here. Well, then what about this? Because it all sort of goes together. And so when we're talking about stories, Getting the whole story is, is important. That's what I'm after. Okay, let's keep going. Let's wrap it up. So I'm going to go quickly because I want to make sure we have plenty of time. Um, so how can children experience a disease be worsened by lack of access? So we can talk about a little bit of the cleanliness of the home, um, access to health care, transportation. Again, all of these are social determinants of health. Ability to isolate, access to healthy meals, parents' job. And then the structural racism that affects their access to all of the other social determinants of health. And then we have a little bit of provider biases as well. Um, and that's the, the kind way of putting in provider biases, I always think. Um, but we also talk about stereotypes and stigmas, right? These are the ones that clinicians can control even when they can't control the outside influences. Um, attitudes and behaviors towards Black patients, um, thinking about what are our biases, knowing them, and being open to acknowledging that clinicians have just as many biases as the rest of the general population. That white coat does not shield anyone from having racial or gender class biases. Um, and remembering that seeing people at their worst can reinforce those negative stereotypes and biases. And when you think about it as medical educators, as some of us in this room are, how we are reinforcing that during their medical education, whether that's in the hidden curriculum or sometimes very explicitly. Sometimes my students will come to me and say, you won't believe what my attending said. I learned of Hispanicus Panicus from a student who heard it from their attending. And I just thought that just never left me. I, I just thought, so this student recognized that it was wrong, but what if the next student does it and goes on to use this term to refer to a Latin patients who are complaining of pain and who automatically assume that they're lying? Um, and that's the that's one of the more mild ones that I've learned from my students that their attendings tell them. Um, but yes, we're thinking about this learned curriculum. And then lastly, thinking about why the story is important to the ethical treatment. So this is an ethics grand brown. Why am I talking about stories and something that's ethical? And for me, I think it's because, one, we all know that Black people have poor health outcomes. And I think that the stories get us a little bit closer to more talking about these numbers and these statistics. But it also requires us to question our values as clinicians and as researchers. We talk a lot about justice. We talk a lot about health equity. We talk a lot about do no harm. But you can't live up to those clinical values if you don't see the whole story, if you don't at least try, if you don't see the whole patient. And I think that stories allow us to use those skills that, you, that we've learned during training, that you all have learned during training, but then also give you this chance to say, I truly believe in the value of humanity. I truly believe in my job and what I can contribute to my patients. Now let me fully put that into action and test those clinical values that I've developed and claim to have. 
And it allows us to go beyond just the talking about the numbers or the talking about these pretty charts. And I think this is a, an essential form of ethical treatment of patients, of research participants. And to not think about it just at one level, this population level, but to think about our duties to these individual people. And I think it sort of allows clinicians to see the person in front of them as a part of a group, but then also as this individual that they see before them. But ultimately, what I think we have to work on, and something that I'm constantly reminding myself, is the listening part. Because this is a great exercise in how do you step back and how do you put the person in front of you in the forefront? But it's also a lesson in just how do we keep quiet sometimes, right? How do you not talk when it's not, not appropriate to talk? But listening, observing body language, what the patient is not saying, I think this is really, really the hardest part of everything that I've said today is the listening part because it requires going beyond ourselves, our own biases, what we would do and that kind of thing and see the patient. So lastly, I think the stories are central to the ethical treatment of Black patients. We have this story that's been taken from them and now given them the power to tell us and to establish that trusting relationship so that they can get better care and be more active in their care. Contributes to a medical pedagogy and practices that eliminate disparities. So I think stories are essential in how we are teaching our health sciences students. But that doesn't mean there aren't practical obstacles, right? You all have limited time with patients, even with research. Um, I'm in a research position. I have to churn out the publications, right? Um, and so there are, there are obstacles. And I think the obstacles and acknowledging them are good. But that doesn't stop. That doesn't mean you have to stop um, trying. But it's good to talk about that. Maybe during Q&A, we can talk a little bit more about the practical obstacles. Goals. But I think ultimately it requires a dedicated effort and a dedicated commitment to doing better. You can't just say you want to. You can't just say, oh, well, this is something we should do. But it's the actions and the steps. What are we doing to say, hey, these are my clinical values and my actions are going to reflect that. And lastly, like Lisa said, my book is available. Everything I said is mostly in this book. It's a book about stories and health and there's QR code. Thank you, everyone.